Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Texture Pop Podcast. I'm professional at its finest. I am your new host, Brandon Lee Carey. Joining me, as always, is my partner in crime, Chris Acharya. Only in a Bethesda game can you have a dude who is just filled with nothing but arrows. Like, I'm just looking at this picture for an article. <laughs> oh, God. Garrett may be joining in or may not be. Not entirely sure, and Sam should hopefully get in before this podcast is over. They're both a little busy at the moment, but we'll see oh, what we yeah. can do. I believe it's best to start, of course, with the news. Uh, our first story of the evening is talking about Destiny once more, because that is the gift that keeps on oh, giving. Oh, yeah. And then we talked about this last week, but... Yeah, this is like the the part three of that story. So, as we reported last week, there is a cross-promotion between Destiny and Red Bull, where there is an exclusive Red Bull quest that you need a can, you need a code and a can of Red Bull to access in Destiny. It won't come out until the Taken King expansion is released. I don't know if it's come out yet or not. I'm not really following those times tables. But until then, you can still get double experience in preparation for that quest coming out. Yeah, you can get an EXP boost. Uh, this was from... An article from GameSpot where they were saying you, you can get codes for an EXP boost and an exclusive quest uh, by buying cans of Red Bull. Now, we had, talk, we had already <laughs> talked about how gross this was, but the thing that... The reason we're bringing this up today is because there's been a, quite a snafu yes. with the codes and the promotion itself. Go on. Essentially... Players were able to, like, I don't know how many digits or uh, characters are in the code itself, yes. but people have been able to actually guess what some of the codes are. And redeem them before the cans were even sold. Yeah, and there's actually, there are already people on Reddit that have gone on record saying that they bought cans that, that are saying that the codes are invalid. Because Probably they've because already the been redeemed were... because yep. somebody else redeemed the code because they guessed at what it would be. Like, this is just, this has got to be just a fucking mess. Like, this has got, like, uh, and what's even funnier is that apparently if you're turning in a code without buying the can, that's considered theft. Like, really? I can understand uh. that why that would legally be considered theft because you are basically stealing a product that has yet to be purchased. Mm-hmm. So but the, it's, I can understand why that would be considered theft. It, it's just, I can't believe this is possible. Like, this has got to be one of those situations of, like, a fucking office on fire and people are th throwing their hands up, like, what the hell do we do? Like, I, I'm not sure what they can do besides, like, I guess give the people who, re who claim to have their code stolen an another code. I don't because, know what else they could do. Because it's like, you know, hey, I bought your fucking energy drink. Why don't I get a code? I mean, if anything, they would probably have to generate something in email to them. But still, why is your fucking code system so damned easy that people are able to just figure it out? I've never heard of something like this before. This, It's probably happened before, but I just can't think of an, a point where I've heard the story or anything similar to it before this. I guess, maybe, but it's not like people can just guess fucking PSN wallet codes or some shit. You never hear about that happening. Well, the but way like, the PSM works is that until you buy at the store, the code is worthless. You yeah, can put the code that's... in, but until it's activated, you can't use it. But for a fucking DLC code on the bottom of a can, it's like, what What do you do? Like, yeah. you can't verify I don't the know can what... was bought? I, I don't know. God, this is just, it's just such a fast, spectacular fucking mess. Like, yeah. Oh. At least it's for just some shitty promotional quest and not something that's like a big part of the game because this could get real. This could have gotten a lot uglier than it is. Oh yeah, it, it could have gotten a lot more hairy. It's just yeah, it, it, it is definitely something where I God, I can't help but imagine somebody in marketing is losing their fucking job over this. Just this one of those is... holy hell, what the hell were you thinking? Oh my Jesus, yeah, that is just oh man, like how could you fuck this up? Like fuck I think that we... shit. I think this is a game point we can safely move on because we're starting to reiterate the same yep. points over and over again. So, next up. So, this is a Kotaku article. And according to anonymous sources who Kotaku have verified RQA testers for Warner Brothers, the mm -hmm. company knew that the Arkham Knight PC port was a clusterfuck 
months before that game came out. Uh, according to the guy Kotaku spoke with, he was saying that problems that existed a year ago, a year ago, were present in what we saw now. And to directly yeah. quote this man or woman, I will say that it's pretty rich for WV to act like they had no idea the game was in such a horrible state. It's been like this for months, mm -hmm. and all the problems we see now were the sa exact same, unchanged, almost a year ago. And, and the thing is, like, Warner Brothers, according to this person, Warner Brothers looked at it and said, it's good enough. And, of course, they were resting on the oh. laurels of, look, we can ship it now and patch it later, which has been the mentality for a lot of publishers. But, of course, you can't do that anymore because Steam... Because the Steam refunds came now. out literally the week before Arkham Knight did, so they could not have possibly yep. anticipated it happening before the game's release. Oh no, you've got to do actual customer service. you got to fucking fix your mess. And Remember, this is, thing... these are the same people who, when Arkham Origins came out, and it was reported to have some pre-game-breaking oh. bugs, it was like, oh, we can't work on patches. We had to work on DLC first. Yeah. Um, Literal exact, like, I'm not I'm not kidding, you can look up yourself. And, and Warner Brothers, they're not the only ones at fault here. Uh, something that was brought to my attention later on, thanks to, like, stuff from Total Biscuit, was NVIDIA was doing all kinds of streams and demos saying, like, look at how much better it runs on PC. Look at how I we can do 60 of frames, of, frames a second. Yeah, NVIDIA, you, you really fucked up as well. That is... That is the epitome of false advertising. Although, right if there. you look at, at the video in in more detail than you could think to look at the time it came out, you can see that it is just blatantly sped up. It, it, it is it, it is incredibly gross marketing bullshit at its finest of trying to trick people into buying a game like this. It's it makes you wonder like what lengths are these companies willing to go through to hawk bullshit at you? It really is like just this example of and, and the thing is, you know, we've both talked about how Arkham Knight is not really a bad game despite its faults. But this is the epitome of just you cannot trust companies to ship you a game that works properly on day one anymore. You just can't. And it's disgusting that we have to put up with this. And this is not to discount the difficulty of porting. We all understand that porting is a difficult job. Yes. But if you're going to release a version on the PC, it had better fucking work right. I mean, I don't think it is unreasonable, especially when you are charging $60 or for whatever DLC content up to $100 for content that we expect it to work the day we bought it. And again, the season pass is still available on Steam, even if the game itself isn't. No, at the time of this recording. I mean, it is, it is incredibly gross. And like I said, the mentality of ship it now and fix it later, you can't do that anymore, publishers. People can call you on your bullshit and get their money back. I mean, the there was something else I had about this, but... Uh, Even just what a sorry state that game was, from what I've yeah. been told in PC. I imagine it would probably take maybe weeks, some probably even months, before that like, is ready for PC version. And, and granted, the reason ports and stuff like this do happen, it is not just uh, because of technical failing, failures, but also because... Just how much of the mess the gaming industry really is right now between publishers, console manufacturers, and the relationships that they all try to balance out of, like, who can we make happy? Who can we afford to piss off? And the fact that that's a question you have to ask, it just goes to show, once again, how fucked up the industry is. Uh, of course, I'm mentioning, uh, kind of referencing a really good escapist article written by Seamus Young uh, about And I will why... post that in the show notes for yeah, the people that's... who haven't seen it by, by the time this comes out can watch it because it came out today as time of this recording and it's really worth the read. Yeah, because it really does, it makes you think more about the process of what goes in and, and it's, it's easy to sit back and ba blame the publisher or developer who have you, but it's really, it's a large problem that exists with the industry as a whole, why shit like this happens. All right, moving into our third story. This is a good one. So this one, I, I find a little humorous. Ubisoft claims they've learned from their mistakes with Watch Dogs. Go on. Little article, yeah, uh, article coming from the Escapist talking about uh, some of the claims that uh, Eve Gilmon, after he spoke with the Guardian about 
you know, some of the shortcomings that Watch Dogs had with its launch, and, you know, maybe they overhyped it a little bit? Maybe yeah, a little? Specifically talking about how in the, the 2012 trailer, which was the first un initial unveiling, it looked so much better than they could have possibly hoped it to be in the final version. To kind of to kind of quote him, this is a quote uh, Eve Gilmore gave the Guardian. It's a real challenge to create those types of games. When they come out, especially the first iterations, they are not perfect on everything. We think we launched a good quality game for a first step in a new brand with new technology. It's just so complex. Seamless multiplayer, connectivity with mobile and tablets, so many things. It was maybe a bit too much for a first iteration. <laughs> you think? And if you want to you know the exact think? trailer, Interactive Friction, before we did our Watch Dogs season, we did a little commentary over that trailer. <laughs> so if you want to watch that with Sam and I talking about it, feel free to go ahead and uh, link that in the show notes as well. He gives a quote. Uh, with E3 2015, we said, okay, let's make sure the games are playable, that they're not, that they're running on the target machines when we show something. We asked the team, make sure it's playable, make sure gamers can admittedly see exactly what it is. That's what we learned from Watch Dogs experience. If it can't God. be played on the target machine, it can be a risk. Now, yeah, not not to defend, you know, bullshit marketing, uh, Ubisoft especially, but I will say with like Ubisoft, you know, obviously they were trying they were trying to make this, you know, this next gen thing of like here's what the PS4 and the X is gonna be capable of. But of course, the whole thing being you put this on three sixty and PS three. Mm -hmm. So why 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 not show us those? And and also I love how he talks about how, you know, connectivity with mobile and tablets, you know. Yeah, maybe you didn't need to include that, jackass. That's, I mean, granted, I know Sam and I, we messed around with that whole uh, companion app that they had for this thing. And that wasn't, and it wasn't really, like, super gross, like, you know. I never touched it. No. I mean, it wasn't anything super gross, like, bullshit they did with Assassin's Creed Unity, you know, far from that. I touched but, that one. Oh, yeah, I mean, we all know about that. But, um... You know, but, like, just the whole hype machine. And I think this is something, like, you know, not just Ubisoft, but the, the industry in general. Stop feeding us bullshit. Just stop. Stop giving us, you know, bull shots and footage for shit that doesn't even exist. Just... A vertical just, slice. Yeah, just just stop doing that shit. And, and I will say, you know, I kind of feel for developers, it, it does kind of also put them in a bit of a spot as well, because now it's like, well... Now we have to make sure we make a targeted demo that that works on the stuff that exists, and especially with a company like Ubisoft that does things multi-platform, that then it can get really dicey. I I can still remember there are previous articles that talk about you know the development process and when you want to do a demo or something to show E3, that's going to take time. That you try to create some portion of a game that's going to be working and be representative, because if you fuck that up. That's gonna leave a bad taste in somebody's mouth when they when they play it at whatever press show that you you're displaying it at. It's why I don't always begrudge like some developers that come out and say, "Look, we don't have a demo ready for E3 or stuff." And, and obviously, you hear some people. It's like oh, that didn't sound too good. No, that's perfectly fine. They want to make sure that they're working on the finished game and what it's gonna be like when it ships, not having to take time out of their schedule, which is incredibly busy, to make some vertical slice of a game just. To show it off but that aside getting back to Watch Dogs, the thing i thought kind of funny about this was that you know maybe maybe ubisoft eve gilmon is kind of pulling a peter molyneux of like yeah we got our hopes too high with this one maybe maybe we'll dial back a little bit next time. <laughs> <laughs> oh man peter molyneux you know exactly what i mean our last game wasn't was you all deserve to criticize that because it was really a bad game but this next one's going to be fantastic yeah, yeah. Trust me on that one. <laughs> God, you know, and and by the way, uh, putting out, you know, hyped bullshit for hardware that doesn't exist is one thing, but also make sure you don't create a character who's a complete ass, you know, make the someone thing people... Is in the 2012 trailer, he actually wasn't that much of an asshole. No, no, he seemed like a, he seemed like somebody you could probably, probably relate Have a to. Beer with. Yeah, yeah. But, in, but they made him an asshole later on in revision. 
I'm the good guy. Lol, 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 lol. Oh so, yeah, I if see. you want to hear a bit more about that, Interactive Friction is doing a season on Watch Dogs at the moment. It's on, it's on hiatus for a moment because Sam just got his computer fixed, but it will be coming coming up again soon. Yeah, but uh, I mean, if they are gonna make a follow up to Watch Dogs, I'll I'll be interested to say the least to say see like how do they handle this one and. What is it going to like? I, you know, what the fuck is that going to be? Or I kind of hope they they let Aiden Pierce just get, fall into obscurity. I mean, not kind of. They... I really hope. I, I I don't expect them to. But I'm talking about mm -hmm. hopes. He. I really don't want them to to use him again. And granted, even if this isn't like you know trying to say like maybe with the next Watch Dogs, but like just with anything else that Ubisoft decides to do, if they hype some crazy bullshit like for Assassin's Creed Syndicate or whatever. If they go hype in that, like they're not gonna, they're not gonna show off some fancy bullshit that doesn't exist yet. So yeah, just stop selling us garbage. Just stop. I think that'll do it for our new so, segment. That that's enough for for today. So Chris, hey, what the hell have you been doing this week? I've been trying to play Assassin's Creed Four, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. I say try because you know I've been making some okay progress in it. But the minute I wanted to try and do, like, maybe some more side stuff of, oh, hey, I'm going to start robbing some ships so I can get some money, right? Yes. I'm a motherfucking pirate. That's what I'm supposed to do. I end up getting, especially, like, one mission where you're supposed to, you're supposed to go to an island and Adi, Adewale is like, you know, hey, maybe we could fuck with the British and steal some money from them on the way, make the trip worthwhile. So it's like, oh, okay, yeah, so I'm totally going to steal some shit. Have you been uh, upgrading your vessel? I have, and I was okay for a little while, and then I got wrecked uh, super hard. And after a while, I just yep. said, yeah, I, like, restarted, like, three or four times trying to go after it. Especially because I wanted to go after, like, a bigger ship to add to my fleet. Because now, like, the metagame kicks in of, like, oh, yeah, you've got your own fleet that you can send to and fro from places so you can make money while you're not even playing, right? I believe it but was a companion that had to actually manage your fleet. While you weren't playing the game, yeah, but I'm not downloading that. But, <laughs> but, uh, but when it comes to you know this whole thing of like, oh, so this is how I can add ships to my fleet by effing stealing them. So it's like I want to get like a bigger boat so I can have them do shit for me. It'll be super awesome. Uh, that it didn't go well, and after a while, I just said, fuck it. I'm just gonna start. After. Although, hours. when you do get strong enough to take those ships, you feel like a badass. Yeah, and I'll give it that. But, like, after wasting hours doing shit like that, I just said, oh, fuck this, I'm just gonna play the story. And that was where I actually felt like I was accomplishing something. Because despite the fact that I'm in, like, the second sequence, there's still a lot of bullcrap that it wants to introduce me to. And I think that's just a problem with Assassin's Creed as a whole. Of, like, it feels like... I can't, I felt like, you know what, I feel bad for ever judging a game for being too linear. Because, like, I felt like I wanted a li can I just get a linear experience? Can I just go from point A to point B, please? I don't want a bunch of side bullshit. You should bullshit. play Final Fantasy XIII, then. I guess. Yeah, I guess I can forgive Final Fantasy XIII for the hallway. I, I, I feel bad that I begrudge that game. Because at least then it's like, I know where I'm supposed to go, and it's not gonna it's not gonna pull me in seven different directions at once. You need to get money for the harbor. You need to do this, and here's some assassination contracts. Oh, son of a bitch. That's kind of Ubisoft's MO du jour. I complained, to, it, it's not as bad as it was in Assassin's Creed 3, but Ubisoft's MO has always been fill it with enough content so that we can say that there is 40 hours or 50 hours of content yeah, in this it's... game. Oh, Even though in actuality, it's it's not that much. It's just a lot of the same stuff over and over. So it feels like a lot. Yeah. In actuality, you're only doing like two or three different menial tasks. And and I know we talked about like Arkham Knight and stuff uh, last week. But uh, listening to a recent Giant Bombcast where they were kind of talking about like... Yes. Uh, <laughs> excluding Arkham Origins because who gives a fuck. But uh, <laughs> between, between Asylum, City, and Arkham Knight... Asylum kind of still feels like this is the this I is agree. the one to play. Yeah, because it's the it, most focused of the three games. By absolutely, far. like it really does kind of live up to the whole saying of less is more. 
because with each game, it's like, let's put more challenges and more stuff and more stuff to put in. And it's just overwhelming to where it beats you over the head with that. And it's like, can I just be Batman and fight bad guys and it's a, play it's the a, story? Like, I understand why they did that for the Batman, though, because it's a hard line to toe. Yeah. You want to be able to add more so that when people say, well, what did you do? You can yeah. point to something that you have added to the game, something that you've made the game better with. At the same time, you also don't want to add so much stuff that it is overwhelming. Yeah. And City, in particular, the Riddler trophies were overwhelming, at least yeah. for me personally. No, I... Night it wasn't as played... bad, but I'd still rather do the stuff in Asylum again because just the fact that there was ah. so much focus in that small... It was a very compact place it's just so much and better designed i mean and there's there's still a hell of a lot to to asylum but it, yeah. it really does kind of feel like you know yeah it may not be packed with as much shit as like later games but it really is a case of like less is more like, so. i might need, i might not be able to grapple gun up to a top of the spire and then glide a thousand meters but i don't have to because the world isn't that big and it doesn't really need to be of course you can't fill it with people either and that's Ubisoft's problem is that they, they, they spend, like, they, they could do with less collectibles. And I've said that yes. for years. You, you know, like, ever since Assassin's Creed 2, I've been on them about the fucking feathers, the flags, <laughs> the collective, like, all the collectible bullshit they really don't need. No. Not it, at all. It's like, I just want to play the story. I just... Like, and I'm sure you just you give do me that. a small level and let me do the, the free running stuff in that small level. I don't need a, a huge city, not really. And it's nice, is, but I don't need it. And the thing is, like, to, to bring this back to Assassin's Creed, like, if you want to just play the story, I'm sure there'll people look, look at you and be like, well, then just play the story. What's stopping you? Well, if I don't do some of this side stuff, I may miss out on some of the best weapons in the game. Yeah. I don't want to do that. And if you miss out on the, you know, the side stuff, then you might end up being weaker than the designers want you to be yeah, for a story Yeah, exactly. Beat. It's like, if I have the opportunity to be overpowered to where I feel like I broke the game, I want that. I, I, I want to be stronger than anybody else in the game. I want to be master of this virtual world that you fucking threw me in. I, that's what I want. And Do a slight like, digression. It's yeah. a well-known psychological fact that willpower is a finite resource that you expend. Yes. So, to tell me something like, just don't do it, <laughs> it's difficult to say that because there's only so much willpower in my brain before I start saying, no, I've got to. It's like, how long, it's like, I don't want to miss out on unlocking these costumes, man. And, and that's variable and... for people, but it's, the fact is, it is a resource that is expended. I mean, even even with stuff like uh, like uh, with the Arkham games, fucking even all the way back to Arkham Asylum, a lot of people could tell you it's like, well, the Riddler trophies don't really give you anything. Bullshit. They give you more experience, and, and they more give experience you means you, concept yep. art, unlock all sorts well, of character bios. Well, like not even like like forgetting any of the uh, like content, but like any of like the DVD features, what have you, like gameplay wise. If you get more, you get more experience sooner. You get more upgrades sooner. Yeah. So you level up. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Also, hi Sam. Welcome, Sam. <laughs> What's up? Now we were talking about uh, some of the time I've been spending with Assassin's Creed Four and just just the overall problem, like with Ubisoft games or with like some of the Arkham games where they just beat you over the head with side content and it's overwhelming. So many yeah. collectibles. The one thing Open in Arkham's up. favor is that at least it's structured, so you can just yeah. look at it and be like, "Yeah, I'm six out of twelve done." Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's why Asylum and Night, to a lesser extent, did do better in the collectibles, I think. But, again, I still think the city's collectibles were terrible. Oh, God, mm -hmm. yeah, there's there's a reason I did not go go back for all I of tried, those things. And then I, I, I sat there, I was like, fuck it, this is bullshit, I don't care anymore. Well, I'm nope. still working on the Riddler stuff right now. Oh, God. Oh, for Night? Yeah. We'll get, we'll get into that in a moment. I can't oh, wait to hear luck. your thoughts on that one. So, so is there anything else you want to say cool. about uh, Black Flag, Chris? I've I've not I've not spent too much time with it because uh and this will probably bleed into something you've been doing is so I started focusing more on Yoko Taro's near. <laughs> yes. Spelled N I E R. Tell me yeah, more about how Yoko is Taro a, is an insane madman. That is a fucking game, man. Yep. Beautiful it is. insane man. So Have you played Near Sim? Uh I 
very little bit of it, but I'm very familiar with it. I'm also familiar with Yoko Taro in general. <laughs> guy's kind of insane. I knew him before you did, even though not by name. No, it's just that guy What who made the game that was freaky. Yeah. So, uh, I think going into this, you know, because this is something that Brandon and myself have both been kind of playing, uh, mostly just for the purposes of discussing it here. And Brandon finished it. I've uh, done all four endings. God. Uh, I have not, because I spent too much time having to re-deliver a package that I broke three times before, or well, actually it was a lot <laughs> more than that. I know what you're talking about! Yeah, and of course, all that fishing. Had to fish. Damn. I Bass got to about 80% finished with the side quests, and then I just said, nah, I'm, I'm done with these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's a lot of fucking side quests in that stuff. There's a lot of some fucking of it... grinding for materials, too, and that... Oh, yes. Now... I hate grinding for shit in video games. This is a general principle. I'm not like, totally against doing it, but Nier does it to an excessive degree. Yes, it is. Because I, cause I looked up some specific stuff and like some of the side quests that come out uh, that you have in Nier, how it really does feel like work of, I need 10 goat hides. Well, that's going to take you a while because one, there aren't that many goats, and two, the drop rate for hides is low. Yes. I, and... I tweeted about that, actually. I was like, you know, they keep giving me goat meat and not goat hide. I hate grinding for bear asses. It's yep. like every bear has an ass, but they don't seem to always drop their asses. <laughs> nope. Those asses, man. Now, considering the fact that this is a game like uh, all the way from 2010, uh, we're not really too worried about spoiling this. So... You don't care, Chris? No, I don't. I, I Okay. I... Because it's going to get some freaky shit going on in this joint. Yeah, because Yokotaro. So, for those who are unfamiliar, to kind of give a brief rundown of the story, is that you play a character who is mostly referred to as the father. You can name him whatever you want. But it uh, seems like a Legend of Zelda situation where it's like, canonically, he's near, but you can just name him whatever. Cause... They don't give him yeah. a, a default name. Oh. I thought it was. It did have a default name. We oh, just whatever. call him near because that's the title of the game, but like... <laughs> So if the he game does, was called his, like, if default, the game was called Busting space, Bungalow, his name would be Busting Bungalow. By default, that name is that space is blank. Saying his name is blank Which is weird. Uh, it, when I play near, I'm gonna name him blank. Hello, insert <laughs> name here. The nameless one, like that Planescape Torment. I would probably like if I played again, I probably would name him insert name here. Insert name here, uh -huh. help me. <laughs> so yeah, the game starts off pretty weird to where it's like it is a post-apocalyptic future where modern society got fucked. And people kind of had to regress back to medieval ways. So and what you're saying is that it's post post apocalyptic. Basically, yeah. Because so suck it, Gorilla Games. You didn't invent that term. Near did it first. <laughs> <laughs> you're fucking. What's What's ridiculous about it is like the game starts almost like in a time where it's like, oh yeah, you see where stuff went to shit. And this dude's trying to protect his daughter, and of course there's this book that is asking him for his soul. And then, of course, he needs magic power to fight these monsters, which are referred to as Shades, uh, which comes in all kinds of various shapes and sizes. I don't know how to describe them other as, like, digital shadows. It's just, they're kind of holographic looking, and but for some yeah. reason they still bleed. Which is weird. We'll get into that when it comes to my turn. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because there are some is, really good plot twists about the shades. Yeah, like, you get that opening sequence, and then it's like, the 1380 years later, like, wait a minute, what the fuck? Like, this guy's worried about his daughter's health, and then they fast forward, like, 13, 000, 1300 years? And then it's like, medieval times. Oh, okay. And, and of course it's funny how they make reference to, like, the old machines, which is like shit we'd probably be using in our modern day, but it's yeah. been so long that nobody knows how to use them. So, so microwave. Yeah. Cooks things. <laughs> as far as like the brief synopsis of the story, it's like, you know, the main hero dude, the father, uh, his daughter is suffering from a strange disease known only as the Black Scrawl. He runs into a, a talking book, which is known as uh, the Grimoire of Vice, which is spelled with a W, but they pronounce it with a V. Uh, it's because it's German. Oh, okay. Yeah, Grimoire Vice, he's a talking ancient book that may hold the key to saving his daughter and possibly saving the world. This is a fucking RPG. Yeah. Uh, and, and along the way, he runs into a lady who wears next to nothing. Like, her underwear may as well be a jock strap because why? 
And then there's another character who I know uh, the name escapes me because I didn't even get that far. Emil. Yeah, Emil, uh, who looks like uh, a really much more weird version of Jack Skellington. He doesn't and... start out that way. Oh, really? He he starts out as a little kid. He has a curse where if he looks at something, they get petrified. Oh dear. So he has a blindfold on the entire his entire time. And when he looks for a cure for his petrification, it cured him of his ability to petrify things, but also turned him into that. Oh dear. So yeah, uh, the story gets kind of weird from there. Because like I said, you have a fucking talking book, which uh, some of the, the dialogue is You don't even know the half of it. You don't even yeah, know how, yeah. how weird that story gets. Yeah, yeah, which I think it's... So as far as like my gameplay experience went... Uh, you know, I was pushing along in the story, and what's funny is, like, the very first thing they have you do is, like, oh, go get some mutton. And it's like, okay, so am I fighting, like, big monstrous animals for mutton? No, it's just sheep. So I just kill ten sheep, got mutton, that was a quest. Like a fucking MMO. You're killing wild sheep. Wild so, sheep. Yeah, and then, Poor of sheep. course, after you do that, that's when the story kind of picks up, and then you're fighting, like, monsters, fight the first real boss... You get, you know, Grimoire Vice with you, and, you know, and then it goes from there, which obviously, Brandon, you've gotten a lot further in, because what I ended up doing, I started doing the side quests almost immediately, because yeah. I had seen some stuff to where, you know, there's good opportunities for money, and like, you know, maybe weapons, or skills, or what have you, but fucking, those took forever, to where oh, I was oh, just- totally. Most of the game's length is in the side quests. Yeah, the, the fucking side quests, like, they have you grind for shit that has, like, a low drop rate. After a while, this turned into a pod podcast game. Uh, it's like, well, let me you, listen to something. <laughs> here's something I learned that, that kind of annoyed me when I heard about it. You can increase the drop rate of rare items by upping the difficulty. Okay. So if you go on hard, you'll be able to you'll find more rare items than you would if you were on easy. God. That annoys the piss out of me, personally. I, I, I mean, I'd been playing on normal, so... Ah, oh, Jesus. But it turned into a podcast game for two reasons. One, I had to grind for shit to complete some of those side quests. And two, while the soundtrack starts melodious and it seems okay, after hearing that same, like, five-minute loop, you want to kill yourself. So, <laughs> I... Yeah, I had to listen to something else. I'm like... I've been doing this for hours. I need something else to listen to. This for me, fucking it was elevator the super best friends cast. Yeah, yeah. Th this fucking elevator music makes me want to either tear my ears off or listen to something else. Oh, I love some good elevator uh, music. In I can't. It, also, when I actually did start playing more of the story, I can't help but see like some of the other like references they make to other games. I think it's like the second or third real boss you fight when you go into this temple. Well, it's not really a temple, but it's like a it's like an old mining facility that's inhabited by robots. Yeah. By the way, this is a fantasy game where there are ro actual robots that you end up fighting for scrap metal. Well, it post, takes place for hundred years after today. Yeah. In theory. So, so the I mean, the idea that robots could still exist is not far fetched. But the boss in there, that is clearly the fucking Egyptian boss from Mario 64, where it is just these two big hands that you have to hit that have an eye on I the I remember hand. that boss. Didn't it, was Legend of Zelda have that boss as well? Wind Waker or Twilight Princess had that? Uh, maybe, but the I'm big say Twilight thing that Princess had two hands with eyes on them. I remember getting annoyed because of the bomb throwing mechanic in that game, because the yeah. way it works is that if you were stationary, you will just set the bomb in front of you, but if you're moving, you will throw it, which means you cannot really accurately aim the bomb because you had to be moving while you throw it. I remember getting, I remember getting really annoyed because I, I that boss would have been a lot easier if the bomb throwing would have been a little better controlled. Yeah, Doku Taro's a, a mad madman, but his gameplay has never really been stellar. No, I mean the combat. Like there were a few it's times passable where... at yeah. best. Like, there were a few times where I got knocked the fuck down repeatedly yes. before I could even get back up. Like, that was bullshit. You haven't gotten there yet, but the fucking wolves and facade are oh. really annoying for doing that. Oh, Jesus. Goddamn wolves. So, and like I said, uh, considering how old this game is and, like, the time we spent with it, not to mention, we really need to talk about some of the how fucking weird this game gets. So, Brandon... Having played through this game and gotten all four of the endings in it, what the hell? What even? Like to continue where you left off in the story, you 
after you get all the sealed verses, all the magic spells that Grimoire Vice needs to defeat the darkness, your village gets attacked. And in the process of, of being attacked, your her, your lingerie-toting friend, who is actually a hermaphrodite... What? Yes, that's why people call it a freak. God. That... Oh my god. Okay. She gets petrified and used to trap the evil, the shade that attacked you in the basement of the library. Also, the leader of the shades, known as the Shadow Lord, kidnaps your daughter, Yona. You fast forward five years later, and the protagonist has grown very bitter over having his daughter being lost for five years. And he just he's just a shade-killing machine at this point. Wow. So, you brought on a quest to defeat the Shadow Lord, and you, you end up saving your friends, and you get your whole party back. And then you have to sit, you have to get these five keys to defeat him. And they're all guarded by five very powerful shades. So you beat them all, you get the keys, and you save the day. Right. And that unlocks your first, your base ending A. To where the world is safe, and now yeah. you get a new game plus that starts from part two. Now the tagline of Nier is, nothing is as it seems. Right. <laughs> so... What they do in ending B is you play through the exact same second half of the game with your level, full level character, but they will add additional scenes that add context to the bosses you're fighting. For example, you recall the two statues you fought in the shrine. Yes, Chris? Yes. Yeah, that was when you first met yeah. Vice. You killed one of the statues your first go with it, and the boss fight you fight at that point at the, when you come back to that shrine, is the other statue by himself. Now, uh -huh. you're led to believe this is just a monster trying to kill you. But in actuality, First the scene before... Before, before that, they, they show you that he is grieving over the loss of his friend that you murderously slaughtered when you oh, went to God. the top of that shrine. For some reason, I knew it was coming to this. And the other shades have befriended him... And now that you're killing them, he's super pissed at you for attacking Great. both his friends and killing the one that he that he was in love with before. But of course, you don't understand the shade language, so you don't know this. So you're forced to fight him again, even knowing that he really doesn't have a beef with you. And uh, yeah, and, and then like all the other bosses are are in this way, like the twins at the at the scrapyard that you were at in the five years between. The time, the time you were at and the second half of the game, one of the brothers gets killed in an accident and the other brother looks up to see a robot in a shade on the, on the side. And he naturally blames the shade and the robot for his brother's death. So in ending A, you go in and kill this robot to avenge them and get the key from them. But in the second ending, the added context is that uh, they had nothing to do with it. They were just, the Shade and the robot were just friends playing in the area. They had nothing to do with whatsoever. It was just a complete and total accident. And so now you are brutally, brutally slaughtering a robot and his best friend Shade. So you're getting to no you're an asshole. Yeah, For no reason. what it kind of seems like. It's Wait a second, I've been playing Dragon Guard. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this the other The whole crux ending. is, you're an asshole. You haven't gotten to this village yet, but uh, in the ending A... You were attending this, this king's wedding, and suddenly the wedding is attacked by a by a wolf pact and led by a shade wolf. And the shade wolf kills the bride of the of the king's wedding. So you go, naturally you go out, you help the king defeat this pack of wolves, and you get the key from that. But there, of course, is added context in ending B. Turns out this wolf was hoping to build to forge peace between uh... his pack and the humans. And then he Great. saw that the humans had been brutally slaughtering all of his friends. So, so I do have to say because that... Because he was pissed off. The way you're describing this now, it sounded interesting at first, but if every single encounter is like that, then that kind of itself becomes boring. Yeah. If everything like, is the same subversion of, no, you were kind of just an asshole. Like, wh why am I playing this? Like, is there one, any of them are straightforward? Or yeah. is, is this like the fucking the, the other, two, like were, the the other two were much more straightforward. Hang yeah. on, is this basically just turning into like the Japanese equivalent of Spec Ops? Like, this is just... Well, here is a twisty just... twist that you reveal at the end of ending A. Okay. The shades that you're fighting are all former human beings. Of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, I could have figured that one out. And in fact, all of the humans you've been playing as, they're just hollow soulless shells. 
Because cool. what the people did during the apocalypse to survive was they removed their souls from their bodies because their their bodies were dying because of the black because of a, a bad disease that the that was the cause of the apocalypse. So they right. decided to make empty shells so that once the time comes they could just put their souls back in their empty shells and they could just live on again as nothing as if nothing happened. They didn't anticipate that these shells are developing a free will of their own. And those shells are the humans that you're playing as. Great. So Yoko Taro made this. Yeah, yes. yeah. This is the Yoko fucking, Taro game through and through. Just, like, I knew I was on a crazy train to begin with, but this is fucking... Crazy train, don't stop. Yeah. Like, what could have prepared me for this? What? <laughs> nothing. That's that's the entire point of Yoko Taro, is that nothing can prepare you for his plots. It does. That's Which, like you know, his, the, the problem entire... is that, like I was saying before, it's almost to a fault sometimes. Yeah. Where yeah. it's like, if it's just so crazy, you can never expect anything, that that itself is just not that interesting. But at the no. same time, like, if you were paying attention, you could have figured that out before the, the twisty yeah. twist. I, I think that the more I hear about Yoko Taro, the more I'm like, I hugely respect him, but he's not, like, he's not perfect, I guess is no, what he's I'm about not. to get at. He I definitely mean, has a lot of faults oh, in his I've, storytelling. I, I'm willing to criticize the hell out of Dragon Card 1 for I mean, many things. Yeah. I mean, the the other thing with, like, the shades, it's like, you kill a lot of them, and it's like, why are they dropping old books? Yeah, why are like, they dropping old books and earrings and, like, yeah. other sentimental pieces? Because they're all people. Yep. And the thing is that sometimes when someone's turned into a shade, that they start, they, they lose their mind, and those are the ones that you fought at first. But in the right. second half, they started recovering, and they started getting sentience, but at that time, they were, they were thought of already as soulless killing machines. So there was no changing that opinion from anyone. Oops. So. And the so, Shadow Lord, that is your original soul. Right. And the reason he kidnapped your daughter is because he was trying to put his daughter's soul back in her rightful body. And I bet you fucked that up as well, didn't you? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, so. Yoko Taro makes a game, part four. Like, that was, that was the, the first. So that's like the third ending, wasn't it? Or that's that was the second ending. The third okay. ending endings are, um, a, as you know, your trans your hermaphroditic friend is possessed by a shade. Right. The third ending is the resolution to that plot arc. And it's actually two different endings. When she loses control, you can either save her by giving her a mercy kill, or you can sacrifice your existence to turn her back into a regular human being. Right. So the first ending that that's not so, that's something you can kind of predict happening. But when they say erase your existence from the world so that no one remembers who you are, what they actually mean is delete all your saves. Ah! Now that's the Yoko Taro that yep. I know. Yeah. So when you say when you and, and they don't they they don't like surprise you with it when you make that choice. He goes warning: choosing this option will delete all of your save files and erase your character from okay. existence. At least it does say that. Are you that sure? That would be pretty nuts if you just like booted it up and like, well, I have no save file anymore. And then he would hit yes, and then he goes, "Are you really sure you can still <laughs> do this again if you want to?" And you go yes, and like he goes, "Are you really sure you want to do this? I'm going to delete all of your saves." And then you Even the yes, ones that you backed goes, up. And he goes, last chance. Are you sure? And then he goes, yes. And then you see the, you know, the Grimoire Vice status screen. Yeah. You just see everything in that screen get cleared out one tab at a time. Great. <laughs> just to watch it slowly. And then it just, just the, home. delete memory one, delete memory two, delete memory three. That's so more when like he says delete your, your entire existence, he means quite literally delete your existence in the game. And if you go back and try to make a new character with the same name, the game won't let you. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, your your existence wow. is well and truly gone. That's more like it. That is the Ogotaro that Sam is familiar with, isn't yep. it? Yep. Because that's not even just the subversion of a trope. That's just like the look, I'm going to do something that, that is nobody, playing, no that, sane developer would ever do. That is playing Erase Your Existence about as straight as a game can. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty great. That's it. Reminds me so much of when Kojima was talking about it. it was like some Metal Gear game or something like that, where he's like, "I want it to, I want it," or it was just some games. Like, I want to make a game that when you die, it destroys the disc. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, that would be great." Like, and then I thought about that when I was hearing you, and no, I was like, "Man, Kojima and Yoko Taro making a game together." <laughs> what a world! And fuck your sixty dollars. Yeah, and basically. I was, like, I was in like, wow, they are really like hammering the point home. My existence is going down, at least as far as this game like, is aware. 
So basically, the very end game of this is that humanity wasn't as fucked as we thought it was, but we just kind of assumed the shades are monsters. Yes. So kill them all and then of course all this other stuff that probably would the basically the world probably it, would have been a better hell place did you have that whole first place where you think you were saving the world under your belt before you do the ending b because once you've already kind of once you've already had that feeling of yeah i am saving the world and then the game subverts it and then you go oh i feel like a horrible person and then it's like again it's like why did i even play this game like <laughs> Not to feel so, good so about myself, So needless to say, obviously. I will not be 100%ing near because I can't. <laughs> oh, did you? So you actually yeah. wrote that option? You didn't just I watch it or something? I went through with it. I totally went through with it. But That's did you get how... all the endings, though? Yes. Yeah, okay, I got so that was the last the one? Yeah, that was yeah. the last ending. That was ending... Like, because, again, ending three and four, they're the two... Those are those two choices. Okay. Right. Holy shit. Uh, I mean, this is getting a sequel, by the way. Yep. Which yeah. makes me wonder what the fuck can they possibly do? But well, with Platinum being the charge, at least it'd be fun to play. Oh, God. Yeah, give me some better combat. Well, as it. long as we get, like, the Metal Gear Rising Revengeance uh, Platinum and not, like, the Legend of Korra Platinum. Yeah, yeah oh, because, right. like, like like I've said before, Yoko Taro is a madman and, and a, a really interesting game designer. But his yeah. the actual act of playing those games has never been great. Like, like you can ask Sam, this... he's playing, he, he was playing Dragon Guard a little... A while yeah. back, and back it's just it's it's not a fun game to play, not really. No, no. but it's fun. It's it, it's interesting. Like I said, you, fucking you just near, play it for the cutscenes. Yeah, yeah if, uh, near. Uh, yeah, if I was interested in near is because you know I'm doing the side quest simply because again I don't want to miss out. Like, what if there's a super dope weapon that I can get by doing some of this shit? Because doing the fishing oh, quest made and, it really and by easy. The way, to get to unlock the third and fourth endings, you need to have all weapons in the game. Great, great. All 30 of them. Great. And, yeah, and, you know, just the whole thing of, like, you know, you don't want to miss anything, you know? And, son of a bitch. Just. Yeah. It, it is a Yoko, Yoko Taro game. Like I said, it just. Through and through. Like, after, like I said, it started playing. Play, the game as an actual play experience really did start to feel like work. And I really do wonder if, like, if that's what he intended it to be. Like, this game is just fucking work. You could be doing something else. Especially when it's like, oh, you're gonna get these endings that show, like, all this murdering and stuff you did. Yeah, you fucked a lot of stuff up. Are you glad you went through with it, through with it idiot? Like, oh. Uh... Yoko Taro possesses a fairly high rate of self-awareness when he well, writes, so, so guy... probably, he probably does intend that to feel like actual work. Like, this guy is, like, this Japanese Andy Kaufman game designer of some kind. Like, just, like the real joke is, like, haha, more people are playing Because I eventually, I started, like, you can get a lot of money by, like, fishing for royal fish in a very civic location. Oh, yeah. I ended up yep. solving a lot of quests by just buying a lot of the materials from yep. the stores. And you actually oftentimes get less money than, <laughs> than it takes to cover your costs. Yeah. Well, it's... I didn't care. I just wanted to finish the quest for my quest log. Yep. Yeah. Just fuck all I, that shit. I haven't read it yet, but I do have an interview pocketed. Uh, I think it was like an IGN interview with Yoko Taro that was about Drakengard 3 and killing in video games. And I was like, well, that <laughs> sounds interesting. Yeah. Cause, oh like, my god, Drakengard 3. I've already talked <laughs> enough about that game, but like, dude. Drakengard game. Drakengard 4 win. It is a Yoko Taro game, no question. Yoko Taro seems like the kind of dev who probably could go to Kickstarter, because it's like, at some point, nobody's going to publish him anymore. Yeah. But, <laughs> some point or another. Not without Kickstarter telling people how how eager they are to play the game. Yeah. So, uh, whose turn is it now? Yeah, I think it's Sam's, because really, that was about the extent of my week, and I think it, the, the same could probably be said for you. Not if... at all. Nope. <laughs> During the 4th of July... I didn't have a lot to do at the party that I went to with my relatives. So I played a few rounds of Paranautical Activity, which, if you guys don't know, is basically the Blinding of Isaac meets a first-person shooter. Right. Yeah, I've, I've vaguely heard of it. I didn't uh, have as much fun with it as I thought I would. Yeah, Chris, you might remember it because it was a game that was taken off Steam. Yeah. Because oh, they sent it? death threats to Gabe Newell. Because oh, the shit. game, like, they changed it from early access and it didn't change and they were losing sales and... Oh, Got taken on Steam. It got put back. I think. Yeah, in the Deluxe Atonement edition, edition because they apologized. Yeah, yeah, I think. I, yeah, I remember hearing about this now. It's 
It's not a great game. It's not a bad game by any means. But there's this... In the Binding of Isaac, when you enter a room, you can see the entire room because it's a Zelda-inspired game. You see that, yeah. that whole room. So when an enemy comes behind you, you know about it, and nothing is unfair. You switch those same mechanics to a first-person shooter where you're in a small room with a bunch of enemies. It's a lot harder. And the game is not generous enough with health to warrant the difficulty. So, like, it, it, it's it's not a very enjoyable game to play, honestly, because you I ended up dying a lot. And I don't find that any of the starting classes that you can pick are really that great for my playstyle. Like, there's one that's just you shoot grenades out of a grenade launcher. There's one that's a shotgun, you have a lot of health. One with a crossbow, and, like, none of them are, like, traditional, like, basic weapons. So it's hard to get, really, like, a feel for them. So I, I just wanted to talk that talk about uh that because compared to Binding of Isaac it's just it's so there's so much similarity but they feel so different all that's right. all I had to say about that but the other thing I did this week and that, that I, I finished this just today actually was I played Devil May Cry 4 again but this time I went through as Lady and Trish and Lady is very fun to play as yeah because I mean she's basically just about guns like yeah, like we're we're in, all the other characters in the game are very melee oriented. She is the only one where her her biggest damage source comes from guns because in all the other characters the guns are just basically chip damage. And it's really interesting to play a ranged character in those games cuz because you don't really do that very often in Devil May Cry. And she, and she has the two handguns, the shotgun and her missile launcher as her three main weapons. And they all have their own special style moves you can do with them. And they, they, they're just, they're really, it's really fun just to shoot a bunch of people with weapons that actually do damage. And they also, they changed a lot of the levels around slightly to fit the fact that she doesn't have, like, the, the throw move that Nero has. Because you basically, you basically, you play through the Nero levels as Lady and the Dante levels as Trish. So, yeah. like, in that boss where you had to throw swords at the, uh, at the window to, do, to kill the boss fight. What they do instead is they let you, if you grab onto them with Lady's Tether, you don't throw them, but the swords will just throw themselves at the uh, at the boss fight because they can't, because obviously Lady doesn't have a throw move, so they had to find some way to let you do damage with those swords. Yeah, I remember doing that right. fight, and I was able to just hit them. It yeah, that that's... Flew up and into the window. Yeah, that's that's how they had to do it, because you can't throw them like you can with Nero. Yeah. Right. You played through with Lady, right, Sam? I haven't finished it yet, but yes. And I've what beaten Devil Cry 4 it? before. Uh, she's very different. She's very, very slow than yeah. anybody else. I like how her double jump is her shooting the ground with a rocket launcher. Yes, which it does damage. It actually does damage. Yeah. Too. So like, if there's someone under you while you're double jumping, they'll take the hit. It's a really cool port on PC, too. Runs at uh, 120 frames a second. Got all that alternate costume DLC and all that jazz. Yeah. I th I think it's just funny how those two characters were supposed to be just costumes, like Don Nero had the lady costume and Dante had the Trish costume, but then they decided, nope, these are better off as full-fledged characters. And I would love to be able to just be, be like the fly in the wall on the day they made that decision. Because that was a really good idea. It really does change the way the game plays quite, quite a lot. It's a good way to do a port, rather than just saying, I don't know, here's that game again. Yeah. Time it runs a little better. And Trish, she plays very well too, because, uh, it's she's not a clone of Dante. She has three weapons. She has the Sparta sword for her two dual pistols, and then her third weapon is her bare fists. So yeah. her her strategy is basically she she uses the sword for sword combos, yes, but mainly I end up using it to throw at enemies because she can throw her sword and like a boomerang thing, and if it gets if it hits an enemy, it will stay spinning around the enemy doing damage. So that's that was her main attack, and then when you do that, there are a lot of moves that she can do only while that attack is where is going on. That let her just do tons of damage. You can kill bosses really fast with Trish that you can't with Dante. She she is basically a pure damage character. She she can't really dodge that well, but she can really hit hard and hit fast. And I probably will play through as Virgil at some at some point, but I, I just really enjoy my Lady Trish playthrough because I I did a lot better than I did my. Nero Dante playthrough. I'm not sure if that was entirely for um, the characters or if that was just me getting more familiar with the environment because I had already played it before. Yeah, uh, it's it's always weird to kind of to switch to like having to change your play style for for characters like that to where 
especially when playing as like both Nero and Dante, who are like kind of melee focused characters, and now it's like you're going to somebody else who is mostly almost entirely fucking uh, uh, ranged with like where like weapons and guns have like a fucking meaning. Yeah, because with Dante and Nero, like they're they they only have one gun move for the most part, which is just shooting with the pistols. Well, they have tons of different sword moves, whereas for Lady, she basically only has a couple of bayonet moves, but most of her arsenal is in the fact that she is in using guns. She has a lot of different moves that she can do with those guns that Dante and, and Nero just can't. And because she's not a demon, she doesn't have double trigger, but what they do instead is that she has a, a area of effect grenade attack that she can pull out instead of devil trigger. And the more devil tr and more bars you have of the devil trigger gauge, the stronger that attack will be when you do eventually use it. So like I, I had points where I was where the boss was wide open and I had a full devil trigger gauge. I used her grenade move. It took off like half the boss's health. Right. So I just I find it interesting that they they, just, they did something to make to make up the fact that she does not have a demon form because she's not a demon. She's a human being. Right. It's also cool but, to have this one, this human being do da do things that Dante like ha like half demons traditionally do. So unless you guys want to talk about Lost Planet too, I think that's it for me. God fucking damn that game! <laughs> wait a minute, what yeah, wait for the next one. Lost Planet Lost two, Planet of course. Two. Oh yeah, no, no. Bollocks to that. Nope. Everything we said about the beginning story totally applies. Makes to the no end. fucking sense whatsoever. There was a story. <laughs> uh, there was a part where the go the dude spoke Spanish. And then the ocean the turns into lava. Not lava. Good lava. Good no, it lava. turned into Tang. <laughs> Good lava. Yes, the ocean of Tang. Yep. Uh, yep. So Samuel. Yep. What'd you do this week? I played a great game. Tell me about and it. That game is what I like to call Paperweight. So this is a game that I recently found, and it's sort of an ARG. It's gonna inv gonna need a computer, a copy of Batman Arkham Knight. And a car <laughs> to go to the micro center. <laughs> so, Paperweight starts out with you banging your head against your computers, it doesn't turn on. And then you decide to sit on your couch and play Arkham Knight because you spent $60 so you'd have something to play. And then once you finish Arkham Knight, you go into a deep depression as you realize you have nothing to play because your shelf is completely empty. And then the ARP part is when you gotta go to the micro center. It's this cool, cool quest. It's like a time quest and you gotta wait like two days. And then when they send it back, they tell you that your motherboard is fucked every which way. Every possible thing wrong with it is wrong. Oh, then, God. after like a week of playing, you get to the one part of Paperweight, which is you get the paid DLC, where you pay $400, and then you replace all your parts. And then Paperweight becomes awesome, Shit, because at that Warner point Brothers you get to play games. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's day how one would you DLC. rate this game on a scale of 1 to 10? Uh, it's... it's, it's it started out pretty good when I was playing Arkham Knight. That was the good part. And then it really drugged down in the middle. But at the very end, when I got to play thousands of games and use the internet, it was pretty good again. So uh, I'd probably say it's 7.5 out of 10. Would you play it again? No, I don't think I would. It's only good so for one playthrough, you think? Yeah. And also, I'd probably wait on a price drop on the DLC. It's pretty expensive <laughs> right now. I just want to wait for it to show up at a GameStop later. <laughs> Half off. So uh, that horrible joke aside. Uh, tell me about I the Arkham Knight. <laughs> it was all right. Not the best Batman game. <laughs> Not the worst. Arkham Forge is still by far the worst. Since we made the last Arkham Knight talk a spoiler cast, let's make this part a spoiler cast too. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say like I don't know what I could really add to it. I don't know what you guys discussed. I'm sure you talked about yeah. uh, Arkham Knight himself and Joker Jason and Scarecrow. God. Yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah. There's just but not like, more I can say other than the fact that like. They, I think it was really, they got too ambitious for their own good, was basically the way I felt yeah. when I finished that game. There were too many side objectives, like, and half of it was just crap. Like, I didn't care about the firefighter quest, I didn't care about, uh, what was it, the firefly Yeah, quest? firefly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I hate the Riddler stuff, but, like, Two-Face was alright, the Man-Bat was really eh, but, like, the serial killer stuff was okay, and then the Batmobile kind of half works, and it was just, they threw in all this stuff, and it's like, I, I just don't care about half of it. So there is something that I, I know we didn't mention last week was, I guess, some of the dialogue you have with the villains changes if you go back and play it after you've beaten the main story. Yes. Yes. In the side quest, because the, the twist at the end is that Bruce Wayne is outed to the world as Batman. So yeah. all of the incidental mooks actually do react to that. Like, some of them are all like, I can't, you know, the fact that he's Bruce Wayne kind of ruins the mystique for me. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know if any of like the actual side quests with the main villains change because that's all like cutscene oriented. But when you're just flying around, you hear a lot of guys go like, "Oh yeah, if I had that kind of money, if I wouldn't be fighting criminals." Like, if there's you haven't beaten the Riddler by then. I love it. He's like, "Oh, I know that you revealed yourself as Bruce Wayne to the world, but you don't think I'm going to believe that, do you? There is no way some white, <laughs> some rich, pretty boy could beat me, the Riddler." Yeah, I'm currently in the process of that. I hate myself, apparently. <laughs> and I, I actually didn't think it was it was that bad, especially compared to City. It's not terrible, it's just tedious. Yeah. Because it's like, because I'm really, really bad at puzzle games, it's like, go to Riddle Area, look up the IGN god, and just see what it I, says. I Otherwise, admit, for the trophies, I, I use... it's like, stare at the trophy for two minutes, figure out the solution, pick up the trophy. I admit, I used the guide a number of times, though I did solve most of them by myself. And then you have to either go find a random guy to go interrogate, or just have to look at a guy to know where all the trophies are. I also, I had that problem where there were... Lo there were those annoying puzzles where you've already figured it out, like, five minutes before you solved it. Yeah, a lot of those puzzles involve, like, the electric charge with the balls, or, like, some of the Batmobile winch stuff. Yeah. Uh, a lot of and stuff things, with robots. I think, Riddler sh I think the Riddler stuff really shouldn't be a test of, like, your physical abilities. More of your, like, your ability to figure something out. And that's where a lot of them were just like, oh, yeah... How fast can you blow up all these things, Batman? I bet you can't beat them that fast, huh? Yeah, it's funny because he still tries to frame it like it's a, a test, like a riddle. It's like it's not really. Or though. then you go go and do one of the Batmobile courses, and he calls it a riddle. Like this is really stretching that definition of riddle, my friend. Yeah. Also, you know, like we could probably argue this to hell and back all we wanted, but I really think it's kind of crappy that they tie the true ending behind the riddle stuff because they must have known that half the people who play that game don't do that stuff. I admit, if it wasn't for the fact that the ending was locked behind the riddle stuff, I wouldn't have done the riddle stuff. Neither would I. Only reason I'm doing it, not because I'm actually enjoying myself. Pretty much. <laughs> at, least yeah. it, at least it wasn't like as bad as City. I never finished the Riddler stuff in City. No, I didn't either. I mean... While I did, like, 100% on, like, uh, Asylum, City was just one of those things, like, I started to do it, and then I was like, fuck this, this is just, <laughs> yeah, like, right. yeah. Yeah, that, and, that sounds like what I did. Like, the fact that I had to switch between, like, oh, this this one's only for Catwoman, like, oh, fuck you, like, I know. I'm gonna go through, and then it gives you an electric bullshit. shock, it's like, oh, no, no, this is, sorry, Bats, this one's for the cats. Yeah. This, fuck this, off, I don't care. God. Like, and something we were talking about uh, before you got in, Sam, was how Asylum really is, so far, like, the best out of the series. So, you know, not just because of the fact, like, oh, it was the innovator, and it came up with all that shit uh, other games started using. Well, not just because of that, but it was really just this thing of, like, less is more. The fact that mm -hmm. it was more focused, and it seemed doable. It was incredibly tightly constructed. Yes. And no game has matched it since then because just the way of sequels is always more. Yeah, so. it, it's like I said in, in the in the earlier in this in this podcast, like you in, in I could not glide to the top of a, of a building and then glide a thousand meters in Arkham Asylum, but I never had to. No. Yeah. I didn't need to, to traverse that big of an area, and it, and, and and that was a good thing. I didn't need to do that that big of a glide. Yeah, and uh. Even though you guys have already discussed it, yes, I should just mention and say that the thing with the Joker is that I really wish they had taken out completely. It's yeah, not only like, just because it's really weird that it's there, but also because whoever played Scarecrow was incredible. Like, yeah, that's yeah. probably the best voice actor I can think of. It's this really, like, low but dulcet tone. And it's like, that's really good compared to, like, the normal people who play Scarecrow. I don't know if you read the rough I have for the article I'm writing this week yet or not, but it's not like, yet. his inclusion kind of makes the other two villains look nothing but nothing like joker but just like joker pawns right because the only reason scarecrow is there is because his fear toxin brings out the joker and the only reason the arkham knight's there is because joker tortured the shit out of him i mean it really did seem kind of shitty that they felt like they needed to bring the joker back again yeah because and they also needed to bring mark hamill again and I like, have no idea what they did to get Mark Hamill back, but yeah, it had to have was... been a lot of hoops because the reason that he didn't want to do the Joker again wasn't just that he wanted vo another voice actor to do it, to have a shot, but it, it actually physically hurts him to do that voice. Yeah, there's a couple of voices I know that do that. That is not, not a problem a, in the metal world. That is not an easy voice to do. 
no. I mean, yeah, it, so the fact that, like, Warner Brothers, ha- like, went through the trouble of, like, dude, come on, come on, like, it's just, like, why did you have to go that far? And it also just seems like such a slap in the fucking face to Troy Baker, who I have seen has not done it. You know, he he did an okay job as Joker. Both, well, he was also, you know, Jason, he's also the Arkham Knight's voice. Yeah, I mean, uh, you Baker know, not everywhere. just... You know, not just as the Joker in Arkham Origins, but also the Joker in the uh, Suicide Squad uh, DVD, uh, which I've heard is okay. So yeah, it just feels like they could, it almost feels like they just couldn't move forward with the exception of we got to throw more shit in here. More Funnily shit in enough, here. I think I had that exact same problem with Arkham Origins is that why is the Joker here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't need the Joker to be in every fucking Batman game. Like he's a yeah, great it, character, and Mark Hamill does a great job, but it's like he didn't need to be here. It it just feels like they lacked confidence in their other villains, or at least yeah. that's exactly of what villains. I said. Actually, almost yeah. word for word, is that it just it feels like Rocksteady didn't have the confidence to write a non Joker plot. Yeah, because which we were is discussing... sad because they had they 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 had the foundation there, like that that plot that was Scarecrow and Arkham Knight. That was a good story. Uh, I, mean, I just found it, found it funny when we discussed the idea of the articles, and I was like, oh, I had the exact same idea for an article. Ah, fuck it, Brandon will just write it because he'll probably say the exact same thing I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, it would have started, I mean, this all goes back to fucking Arkham City when a lot of that was supposed to revolve around, you know, Hugo Strange and Ra's al Ghul, but considering that Mark Hamill was retiring from the role, it's like, well, now we got to do something. And then... Yeah, yeah and, and, and having, that, I was having... fine with that because that was supposed to be Mark Hamill's last, jo- last hurrah as the Joker, and that made perfect sense. Yeah, and then getting Warner Brothers Montreal Studio to do something with Origins, I mean, and the best they could do was, like, we can have the Joker, like, as a kind of a surprise, but also, like, here's some stuff with Deathstroke and Black Mask and blah, blah, blah. I mean, yeah, Batman has a wide range and a wide number of villains, but, of course, when you're trying to sell a game to, like, the mainstream audience, that does limit your choices, but that's not to say that you can't pull from a lot of stuff. You I, probably could have pulled, like, any villain from, like, the fucking animated series and people would know who that was. I thought it was funny because I remember when I played Origins and they revealed that the Black Mask was secretly the Joker. I, God, I was like, yeah. oh, God, clearly this was supposed to be, like, a big twist that I could have never seen coming. But I'm just kind of like, why? Yeah. yeah. I'm not I'm not like, oh my god, Joker. I'm like, why is the Joker here? Why yeah. is this a Joker plot? We didn't need this to be a Joker plot. You had a great hook there with Seven Assassins. I think it's also another shot in the foot that around the time those games were coming out, we had the uh, what is it, Christopher Nolan films? Yep. Because they had one for Scarecrow and Joker and uh Bane. And it's like, you know, the Joker one, at least in my opinion, was far and away the best, but it doesn't mean the other ones were bad. Like they it just showed, it's like, yes, you were capable of doing a film without the Joker. And it was just kind of funny to see those games come out, and they just felt so unconfident doing it without one. I mean, and it's like, come on, man, there, there are movies about with, there are hundreds of comics without the Joker. Yeah. And again, that Scarecrow plot with the Arkham Knight, that was a very good plot. Yeah. Like, that actual plot was, was yeah. great. And I just, I wish, like, I can, I think the other big problem I had that I was... You know, one of the things I thought about writing about with it was that just by virtue of the Joker being there, it takes away from the ground of everybody saying we live in a Joker world. Yeah. The thing with Harley, she's like, he's dead. And, you know, like people, all the goons constantly referencing, oh, he's dead. It's like, I wanted to see what is a world without the Joker like? What is the mm-hmm. villain system like? But they won't allow me to, like, think about what it's like not to have the Joker around because it shows up literally in your face constantly. Yep. And then there's and this it just problem. Bugged me cause it's like, I can't. Like, I can't feel for him if he's always there. And then there's that problem where um, him his inclusion kind of makes the Arkham Knight look like a pussy. Yeah, but he should have been where, really awesome. Where Arkham Knight is like, oh yeah, I'm so good. I know exactly where your weakness in the armor is. And then, like, he walks off the screen and then Joker immediately goes, did he really think that one bullet could take down the Batman? Uh, yeah. yeah it's and I was just... like, you know, that really does tear down the the like the, the mystique that you were building up literally just a couple seconds ago. Yeah, and that's a shame too, because uh, that's one of the better parts of the game, is the... I mentioned it to Taylor when he came over and was playing it for a bit, that not since the days of fear have I seen AI actually speak like they're a squad. 
So that was oh, one man. of the interesting and, parts and is when you're doing like the Predator stuff, having people, whether they're doing it or not, whether they're really good AI or not, the illusion of how good they are is magnified just because they say things like, all right, go two and two because he's going to try to pick you off one by one or like get look under the grates. Yeah. Like just the fact that they speak like they know what's happening goes a long way to Even making better, you feel like, pressured. Like if you start doing a lot of great takedowns, they'll actually bomb the grates so you can't use them again. Right. Um, so I it's found like, that it's like really interesting. it's like the Mr. Freeze fight from Arkham City, where it's like, oh wow, this is actually really interesting. Yeah. I can't rely on the same tactics over and over again because then they'll start getting wise to them. I would probably go as far as to say that might be the best design part of that game, just because it's such a thing nobody thinks about is yeah. uh, AI actually speaking to you like they're real people. It goes a long way to making it feel real. Yeah, man, that, that that game does a lot right. It's just like it, there's so many little things that, that they could have done to make it that much better. Yeah. There's also the thing like, why am I doing parkour in the Batmobile? <laughs> yeah, I, I think... have a jet that ha that we know has the power to pick this Batmobile up and drop it out wherever I want. Why am I doing parkour? More importantly, why don't you just fly the jet? Yeah, exactly. I don't know. Yeah, that game has uh, problems. Uh, yeah, although I think something that's probably going to be more interesting is what Rocksteady does after this. Right. Because obviously they have talent to do a lot of better stuff. And, uh, I mean, weird enough that somebody, I guess somebody had said, like, they may think about doing a Superman game, which... There are allusions I, to it, yeah. Yeah, which... I know that's the, where the rumors are, but if they want to continue Batman... I kind of want them to do Batman Beyond. I, you know what? I don't want them to do another Batman game. Period. I really don't like it. Even well, if I it think was... it's a question of, and I was going to bring this up too, is that I don't think it's a matter of them wanting to. It's a matter of Warner Brothers saying they have to. Yeah, yeah. But even Which is still... to say, if Warner Brothers said they had to, and if they, it was like, if it was like, no matter what, a new Batman game has to come out, do Batman Beyond. Just fucking divorce yourself from like classic Batman because that is so done. It is so yeah. far. I would done. say just let Bruce Wayne be Mission Control, and that's great. That's I... all I need from him. I don't need him to do anything else. Give me something but I don't, different. I, I don't want even that though. Like I don't like if it was another Batman franchise game at all. I I don't want it. I, I I'm I'm done. It's also me partially saying that because I'm not sure you can make a Superman game be good. That's that's the other thing. If they, nah, if, man, the if Superman do... movie game was great. Well, Jesus. Superman 64, second best. But, like, a Superman game, obviously, don't take this same fucking engine and just so throw Superman in it and expect it to work. No, you Superman really... Superman doing counters, Superman you really, doing capes, capes Yeah, you, you really have to fucking Superman, do something Superman entirely walking. different. Yeah, I just love the idea of like Superman walking instead of the grapple. He just points his fist and flies towards the ledge. I mean, like, just yeah. he doesn't walk, he just floats over the ground because he's Superman. That's what he does. Me personally, why, why walk? Me personally, I think uh, a decent Superman game could probably come in the form if you wanted to do something like Shadow of the Colossus, but with Superman. Of yeah. here's here's somebody that's causing trouble. Fucking go get them. You know, of course, you'd also people... have to be less depressing than Shadow of the Colossus. Well, yeah, nah, make yeah, it just as depressing. That's what I want to see. It's, it's... I want to see Superman kill bad guys and gradually turn evil. No, uh, no but no, not like Jesus. the movie though. Not that no. way. Not <laughs> like that. No, like uh, yeah. I mean, if you did it, I mean, that's what I think really would be an ideal Superman game. Is that because a lot of people want to hold him to like traditional video game tropes of like, well, how do you have Superman fight a bunch of low level bad guys? Hey, hey, idiots! You don't have him fight against the dudes that could actually hurt him. Which there are a number of, because a lot of people think like, well, he's invulnerable. How do you... I don't know? Look at the animated series, morons. There's a lot of people that can hurt Superman. So what if we just like put like a kryptonite fear toxin in the, the that's air? Not the, that's that's always the thing too of like. <laughs> it's well, always only... like this excuse that we can make him vulnerable. That's Magic the other or kryptonite. Yeah, let's that's... convince. Let's make him kill his wife. Let's have the Joker See, make him kill his wife. The, the, I, yeah. the idea. The idea that people think that he's only hurt unless you've got this one special MacGuffin just shows that, well, you don't know his gallery of villains, moron. He's got just about as much of a rogue gallery as Batman does. And guess what? A lot of them could beat the shit out of Superman without using kryptonite. Make him the, fight sorcerers. The fu <laughs> Well, like, not even only that. Fucking, you know who the parasite is? No. You know no. who Livewire is? I have no idea Fucking, who you're talking about. No, that's about. a torrenting site. And the thing is, those are all characters that appeared in his animated series. People know who the fuck they are. 
And granted, now Mattel it has is been kinda... a very long time since I saw the Superman cartoon. Well, yeah, but like, well, I own the DVDs, so. But... And Batman stands out a lot in my, in my head a lot more. But like, fucking, uh. Metallo, and yeah, granted, yeah, Metallo has a piece of kryptonite, but also he is a robot that can hurt the shit out of Superman. And I know Doomsday. That's what I know. Yeah, and Doomsday. Which was that death of Superman? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, there you I, go. I mean, canonically, he didn't really kill him. He just kind of beat the shit out of him enough to where his heart stopped beating, and then he just came oh. back. Boom. I, I don't know. Like it's, it's, really, it's, it's really was dumb. Was Bizarro a thing? Am I misremembering something? That, that's or... right. Yeah, Bizarro. That's like yeah, Mega Bizarro Superman, Superman. basically. It's, that's <laughs> another character that could beat the shit out of Superman. Again, it's like people who want to think that Kryptonite is the only thing that could hurt him. Obviously, you don't know enough about his other villains, do you, idiot? God. This may be talking a bit out of my depth as far as game mechanics, but I think there's also this idea of the only way to equate player death is the character literally dies. There is the idea of, like, Superman could have a health bar, and it could just be that when the health bar drains, he is unable to move and or, you know, yeah, do anything until the point where the world is destroyed. Like, he doesn't have to, quote-unquote, die. He just like, basically just has to be at a point where he cannot do anything. Yeah. You could also have, like, a health bar for, like, the the world or the city where every time they see oh, Superman get hit. No, 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 they, 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 they did that. They tried that. Shit. <laughs> they did that shit, and it was god not good. But, fucking... but I, I just think there's this weird idea of, like, video games where it's, like, the player end is always player death, not just, like, player unconscious or player unable to move. It's always, like, it's, like, just reinterpret it as Superman's not dead. He just like can't do he gets, anything. If he loses all his health, he gets knocked out for a little bit and then yeah. comes back later. Yeah, and I mean... then just say, fuck it, just, like, restart checkpoint. Because whatever, it doesn't matter if he's dead or not, just you, your life bar drained, whatever, restart. You died. Like, you look, you look and at, you lost like, all again, your souls. referring back to the animated series, which seems to be the only people who were able to write Superman, right? Fucking, <laughs> when Darkseid shows up, guess what? Not only he beats the shit out of Superman, but he actually holds him in something he can't break out of. Figure that out, idiots. God. Well, like, I think, or you uh, just give all the all the bad guys kryptonite weapons and that solves that problem. Like, give, give all the uh, moves kryptonite shotguns. Is that shotguns. your answer to everything? Yes. Well, that's the average iron answer to everything, is kryptonite then they shotguns. Fucking look at the road is else. made of kryptonite. The buildings are made of kryptonite. If you, go, if you fly too high in the air, there's kryptonite. We, 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 made, point... we made the walls all out of kryptonite, and it's so <laughs> bad that all also, the people in the city so, have to Brandon. leave. So we got these rings that are made of kryptonite, but if you fly through them, the rings will shatter. Oh my god, you have a both time of you were idiots. Listen, <laughs> fucking, once again, looking at the animated series, Darkseid gave fucking gang members and thugs... Alien technology powered weapons. Once again, they could hurt Superman. None of them run on kryptonite. They're just. So, uh, how will we explain 6.3 million people being evacuated in 24 hours? Oh, that's the real rock steady question. Uh, yeah, how can we empty this city completely? Thing. Yeah. That but might be again, one of the worst parts of Arkham Knight. But then again, like. God. You, yeah, I remember it, saying that during the last podcast. It's like, I imagine the, the, the people God City would scoff. At a scarecrow toxin attack, like I, because I if you if you live in that city, you have to be either really brave, really stupid, or really tough. Yeah, it's like whenever I when I saw the beginning of that game, the first thought that ran through me the whole time is like, who lives in Gotham? Like, are they're just like, is the pay just like incredible to live there? Is the rent just like dirt cheap? Like, who it's lives rent there? It's controlled, Sam. You don't understand. It's just like, it's why would you live controlled. there? And it's the same problem with Superman and just comic books in general. So people just hand wave and just go like, I don't know, it just needs to be there. But it's like, if the guy named the Joker showed up and could kill you any day, why would you live there and not move like three towns over? It's like, if, you were, like if that? you were in Spider-Man world, why would you ever live in New York City? I don't know. Anyway, I I think Superman, it could be interesting. I'd be curious to see that more as just a curiosity, even if it was bad, just to see someone try again. Uh, people have also been rumoring a Justice League game, which could be slightly more interesting because then it's like, it's, if Superman's not the focus, you don't have to worry so much about that. One of the focus will be Batman because we already have that gameplay p down pat. Yeah. Well, it would be cool to also play as like Hot Girl and Green Lantern and Marching Manhunter and Flash. And Flash, yeah. Flash would be cool. Especially Wonder open Woman? world, Flash. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. I mean, you kind of got a taste of that with like <laughs> Six Row 4, but. Yeah, it's basically that. Just fucking jump over buildings go like, I'm the Flash! And yep. Batman's like, I'm Batman! Let's give your man a dubstep gun. Okay, oh, I'm down. His power will be that he has dubstep breath. <laughs> Eats too many burritos whoa, and he gets whoa, dubstep whoa, breath. Whoa, 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 whoa. What are we talking about again? I don't I, know. Rock City, see what they do next. Yeah, I'm trying to think if I played any other games. I guess I did. I, like, touched some other things. 
not played Xenoverse. Um, I'm trying to think between the last, I've been off the podcast before this, so I guess uh, another thing that I did, which is pretty great, is called Akiba's Trip, Undead and Undressed. Oh, yeah. Okay. That also known like as Akiba's anime. Strip, Undead and Undressed. That's yeah, the joke. What, what is this game? What people. kind of anime shit have you gotten yourself into, Samuel? Oh, I have gone all the way trash, man. Have you become uh, I, trash? I haven't played enough to discuss it. I've accepted it, basically, more or less. <laughs> uh, writing about that at the moment but uh i haven't played enough of it to really discuss it but another game that i started on is hyper dimension neptunia rebirth one Can which is a game in panties? which uh yes of course in that game that's the one where everybody exists in the world of game industry and all the characters <laughs> represent microsoft sony nintendo and the main character is called neptune because it's a reference to the sega saturn because this game was published by sega and Sega is the one that gets beat up by all the other hardware companies, so it's the underdog that has to save the world. Because only Sega can save the world. Oh Literally, like, the four goddesses when they fight, it's called- it, the world is called Game Industry with an I, and they just say the war between these goddesses is known as the console war. And Sega was the one that got kicked out of it at the very beginning sure. of the game. And I was <laughs> like, that's a little weird. Apparently, like, this kick game, you go back to the past and you beat the equivalent of the Sega Game Gear. In girl I form. don't understand. What is this supposed to be a metaphor for? <laughs> okay, you so haven't, explain. So, you video games, 1984. Thick, you haven't laid it on thick enough for me to get it, Samuel <laughs> Callahan. Okay, so in 1984, Nintendo released the Nintendo Entertainment System. Nice. Sega released the Sega Master System. Anyway, so, Occupus Trip. It's a brawler where the whole concept is that you punch people in their heads, their torsos, or their legs. And if you punch them enough, then you hold the button, and then you strip that article of clothing. You strip all the clothing, and that because they are synthetic vampires called synthesters, they will burn in the sunlight and die. You mean like they suck blood? Yes, but they're called synthesters. Okay, go Cause, on. Because Japan. So, the, for, I want to start off from the very beginning, which is the beginning of the game basically starts off like a visual novel, where it just says like, oh, you're on your way to your new job. You were told, it's like... Who live alone in your apartment collecting your figures and all your dojins and it's like and you're getting a new job where you were told you're going to be paid in figures instead of money like figurines so you go there and it opens up with you being strapped on a table and some guy's like so how's the job going and you talk to him and like the normal conversation route he's supposed to just be like oh let me out of here and at some point he's like oh you're gonna work with us like i'll never help you and then you know you get saved or whatever so because it plays like a vn though I chose the third option, which is like, he's basically like, you're going to work with us? And you're like, do I get my figures if I work with you? And he's like, no. And he's like, all right. He's like, do you really want to work with us now? He's like, so what if I get my figure? And he's like, do you want to die? And he's like, do I get my figure if I die? And then he literally just kills you and it says bad end. And then it puts you back to the start screen. <laughs> so if you choose the third option, you can lose the game before you even start playing. If you ask for figures instead of trying to save the world. That's a note to set. Past that, I've not played too much, but enough that when I had Taylor over, we were just laughing out loud with the English voice acting. Because, like, you get saved by this one girl, and she, like, uh, she, like, kisses you and gives you blood or something like that. I don't know. And then when you get out, there's this girl comes up to you, and she sounds... She's not the same voice actress, but she sounds like the English version of Konata from Lucky Star, if you look it up. Has that kind of voice. She shows up, and she's like, oh, hey, broski, it's your little sister. What's up? But, like, in quotes, little sister, like, your emoto. And she's like, and now you're gonna buy this dress for me. And then she just runs away, and then she sees you again, she's like, yo, protagonist, what's up? And then when I met her for the third time, she called me Broccoli. On a scale of one to anime trash, <laughs> how would you rate this game? This game breaks the fucking scale, man. Like, <laughs> oh my god, anime. I don't think I've played a trashier anime trash game than this. <laughs> There is, like, the people you meet up in your club is like, here's your childhood friend who's totally in love with you but won't admit it. Here's a guy who wears a t-shirt with an anime girl on it, and he's really, he know he speaks in anime and video game terms. Here's a so uh, this foreign is girl wearing a maid costume. So this is worse than typical weeaboo anime trash? Oh my god, it is the trashiest. So I'm guessing it, you're it's incredible. It, yes? Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> Like, when you're just walking around, they also have names for all the characters, so you just see things like Salary Man, and at one point I saw one that said Boy Love Girl, like BL Girl, you know, I was like, I oh god, there are for I don't even in this hate game. anime, so I don't know why I keep bashing you for it. I, it's, dude, you should see this game, it might make you hate anime <laughs> if you don't like it already. <laughs> I, I, I don't find anything, I don't have anything against anime. I don't like it more than anything else in particular, but like, it's not bad. I, I can't talk considering I fucking went and bought J-Star's Victory versus Plus, so... That's anime right there. 
that's like, I haven't played it, but that's probably at least slightly respectable rather than a game where it's like, you want to take the girl with the maid outfit to fight with you because then you can level her up and get her special ending. Or you get to make out with her, because it's also a dating sim as well as a brawler. Like that. It's called Persona 3. Yeah, except this one involves less saving the world and more beating up dudes, and then making out with the girls. I don't know. It was weird. Uh, apparently I also tried to change their clothes, and you have to be a certain rank in order to change their uh, clothes, and you have to be an even higher rank to change their underwear. You are badass enough to change my <laughs> panties. <laughs> like, it would try it, it, like, the character, like... <laughs> Like, it's set, plus a message that's, like, not high enough character rank to change this. And the character's like, no, you can't change that. You a bad, <laughs> like, are you a bad I love the, I, Like, in universe, it's underwear? like, you just lift up your skirt, like, I need this underwear. And you're like, no, I can't, oh you can't take God. it. Because you can wear the clothes. I, I looked it up because I was curious. And it's like, when you get to a later point in the game, you like, there's a story point where you can start cross-dressing. So, because all the clothes have, like, different stats. So oh, I tried putting you... on, like, a dress, and it was just like, you can't wear this yet. I was like, oh, great. Oh, I'm sure so, you're loving this. Oh, it's that's my like, game of the year, man. Apparently, you can also <laughs> change out the player model later because the PC version lets you play as the, the little girl, the Emoto. Uh, but like the beginning of the game was just I walked around Akihabara and I had a computer monitor on my back and I just beat the shit out of people with it and then tore their clothes off and then they burned alive. So that was pretty great. So when do you face <laughs> out, hold out, and reach out to the truth? Uh, that's like six hours in. I'm like two hours in. It's a good game, though. Pretty trashy. I've, I've been really reveling in my trash lately. Between that and Hyper Dimension <laughs> you, Neptunia. You've been reveling in the Ibu anime trash? <laughs> just been trashing it up. Oh, we've got we've got more trash to play through with some of the shit that we have, so... Oh, yeah. Now they got my 360 back. Well, so Human Demon stuff. isn't is an anime trash, but it is trash. Yes. Yeah. Regular trash. Trash standard. Oh my god. Yeah, I guess uh, the last thing I'm gonna point out, just because it is relevant to the time, is that apparently this thing on Twitter that Brandon didn't know about was going on called JRPG July, uh, which <laughs> my understanding is the idea is just play our JRPG, like start and finish it in July. So I picked up a game that, uh, I picked up Tales of Vesperia, and I knew I played it before, and apparently I still had my old save file. So I looked at it, and it was 12 and a half hours in, and the last save was uh, April of 2009. <laughs> Jesus. Wow. Which was pretty incredible. That was my second year of high school. Was the last time I played that game, and I still had the save file for it. Oh, so, oh and, uh, crap! Apparently, I still have my Lost Odyssey save too. I haven't looked at how far it was or when it stopped. But I'm guessing La 2009. Last time I did something like that was actually you guys remember when I fucking played my PS2 copy of Kingdom Hearts 2? Yeah. And I still had a fucking save file from like the year that game came out. Like, God, <laughs> that's incredible. I still have saves in the original Dot Hack games. Dot hack. Yeah, fuck that. <laughs> it's a neat concept. Don't play the games. Uh, Watch it. Did you hear the anyway. fourth game is apparently like $150? Jesus. Uh, that sounds about right. I'm pretty sure they're rare. Just watch the show, man. Or read it. I still have <laughs> all four games. Dealt for a million dollars. Problem solved. I remember watching the show and just seeing like the main character and thinking, this guy sucks. Yeah. Yes, I, like, I did play other stuff, like I went to GameStop and bought a couple of things, but because the computer was busted, I didn't do too much. I'm trying to think of like what I did day to day, I guess I just kind of hung out with friends. Uh, last night, I saw Mad Max again because Taylor hadn't seen it before. <laughs> so it was pretty cool to see all his initial reactions for the first time seeing that film. Like at one point, he was asking about the characters, like all the uh, women, he was like, so what are their names? And I was like, I don't know. And then we looked at the credits at the end, fun thing is that they actually name all the characters, including the ones that never get a name in the movie. So the guitar guy with the guitar that shoots fire, his name is the Doof Warrior. That's his name. And the surgeon guy is apparently named the Organic Mechanic. <laughs> and, like, they named all the wives. There was, like, Cheeto and things like that. And it's just funny to look at this, and it's, like, it's just all the dumbest names because they weren't named in the film, so they can just call themselves whatever they want. But I believe that is it for me. Hopefully next week I'll have actually played things now that I have a working computer again. Which thus far is actually runs a little bit better, runs a little bit quieter, and has not caught fire. So overall, doing much better than the last. Battle <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, that's usually a plus. Yeah. And my last we one burned so my bad. fucking house down. Yeah. And with that, this episode of the Texture Pop is coming to a close. Chris, did you do anything that you want to plug this week? Not a damned thing. <laughs> Damn. Well. Did you um, want to? Do you plug anything, even though you did nothing because your computer wasn't working this yeah. week? <laughs> So I had my laptop, which I was trying to work with, um, but I couldn't get much done with that with two bad USB ports and no working Wi-Fi without a Wi-Fi stick. Uh, 
Uh, so I am working on my article about internet identity. So hopefully I'll be at that next week. And assuming that I don't sink my money into something else where I don't have to pay off something, I might finally be able to afford Nogato, which means I can record our Friday night floor player stuff and you know, Chris's oh, stuff man. and all kinds of console footage. Oh, man. And possibly console I cannot wait stuff. to see that shit that we do with Ryu Kun <laughs> on the channel. Yeah, that's going to be really something to watch. I, uh, I just remember this all fucking started because of Fuse. This... That means we need to start <laughs> playing Sony Smash Bros. together. Oh, we do. Oh, God. Also, Fuse is to blame for this. You know? Yep. We've done, what, Fuse and Lost Planet an off week for Anarchy Reigns. Next yeah. is supposedly yeah. all for one. I think it's yeah. next. And we want to also do Helldivers and Guilty Gear Zerd. Not to mention, I, you know. I just ooh, ordered yeah. Guilty Gear off Amazon. It should be in soon. You know, not to mention, we all bought fucking Sacred 3 because it was on sale. Right. Got like a billion games to play. Yep. Whole list. Anyway, might start recording that soon, hopefully. And, um, awesome. Interactive Friction might start going up again <laughs> now that Sam has his computer yeah. back. So, we'll see. Assuming... It depends on how, how, how much shit is on his plate, which seems like a lot since he's been Yeah, so out. the other fun thing is that at the time it's recording, assuming... Nothing went wrong. I had to make a couple of calls today in the past few days. I'll be starting school next week, which means I'll be working at school three times a week and working those off days, at least for one week. So we'll see because, like I said, assuming I go to school, I will be at school or working Monday through Friday next week until I get my schedules realigned. So we shall see. Uh, I will try to put it up by this upcoming Monday, but I'm not going to make any guarantees on that because, yeah, I basically have to, like, work on articles and videos and i have a big video project that i'm getting paid for that i'm working on all kinds of stuff i will get it back as possible so I fucking finish watch dogs and i can never but play it will that be game nice again. to be able to finish that game and move on to something else anything yeah. else besides watch dogs of course, we have a lot left of that game we need to go through don't remind me we are Bro. so far behind uh eventually and um as for me i alluded to it earlier during the arkham knight segment but i am writing an article about how Rocksteady's writing in Arkham Knight seems to indicate a lack of confidence in their ability to write a good Batman plot. It's still a good game, I understand. It's a very good game, it's just I, I have a lot of problems I need to, to talk about. Yeah, yeah man. Or at least, the... well, specifically one big problem I need to talk about, because because everything else I could possibly talk about has already been talked about with some other person. Yeah. But I haven't seen any articles about this particular topic. So that's why I'm writing this one instead of another fucking Batmobile article. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be writing about Man Bat, right? The really crucial side story. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, told, I just did that side quest and I was like, well, that was a huge waste of time. And I think we can safely say that, th that this is the Texture Pop signing off. <laughs> Hopefully. Yep. Can we safely say anything anymore? In our no. horrible digital future. <laughs> Good night, guys. Bye, everybody. Later.